Hi, Jacob Klinger, your Steelers beat reporter, PennLive.com. It doesn't feel like it's been three weeks since the Steelers season ended, but it has. Uh, and as they continue to mosey on through the offseason, uh, they're cleaning up just a few items in terms of how they form their 90-man roster for the offseason. They re-signed tight end Javier Grimble uh, to a one-year contract. Uh, it was first reported by TribLive.com. His agent confirmed as much to uh, PennLive. Grimble only caught uh, 11 catches for 118 yards and two touchdowns this year. Only played in 13 games. Had a leg bruise, had a cracked ribs at the end of the season, and you know, frankly wasn't a huge part of the team's offense. But when I hear about Javier Grimble and I think about Javier Grimble, I always come back to this um, instance that happened in training camp uh, up in Latrobe. They were just doing like a, a tight ends versus linebackers type drill. And I distinctly remember Mike Tomlin shouting at Grimble, you're too talented not to be dominating this drill. And that's largely played out even throughout the season and practices. Uh, Grimble was actually an undrafted rookie free agent guy out of USC. They didn't use the tight ends a lot. Um, and he came into the league in 2014. The 2016 Steelers roster was the first 53 man he ever made. He bounced around from the Giants, the 49ers, uh, the Patriots, I think, for like a week or two. Um, and finally was on the Steelers practice squad in the 2015 season. Finally made the team in, in 2016. Uh, and actually, the two catches he made were pretty key. Uh, one against the Cincinnati Bengals in week two, and another one was the opening score for the Steelers in the division clinching win over the Baltimore Ravens. And he really is the only downfield threat that they have that isn't facing a postseason you know, health valuation in terms of in the way that Ladarius Green is. He's much more mobile and athletic than Jesse James is. Uh, he's much less limited in terms of strictly being a blocking tight end in the way that David Johnson often was. The Steelers will probably look for outside help at tight end if Ladarius Green can't come back and, and be something resembling what he was at different points uh, during the season. But if not, Ladarius Green is, is reasonable cover. Um, has all the build to actually do what he needs to do. His hands have let him down a couple times, uh, but he was the only real piece of business that the Steelers handled this week, and um, expect that his deal was probably close to the minimum for a guy with one year of experience, which would have been about $540,000. So whatever he's doing is not costing the Steelers too terribly much against the salary cap. Next week, uh, starting Weber, uh, <laughs> Wednesday, February 15th, the franchise tag window opens up for the whole NFL. And it's especially relevant to the Steelers, more so than usual, because the NFL Network has reported that the Steelers want to franchise tag Le'Veon Bell. So start running back, they probably wouldn't make the playoffs without him. He's really good at running the ball, catching, and then running some more. Um, might be the best at it in the league, actually. But he's ended all but his rookie season injured. He's had several drug suspensions, or two, I should say, two drug suspensions. Um, Art Rooney II, though, said, look, we think all that stuff's behind him and he's part of our long-term future. They could lock him up for the long-term and place him on a franchise tag at the same time. Quick recap, franchise tag is when you offer a guy an elevated base salary for one year and he basically has to accept it. But what it also does is it forces the guy to come to the negotiating table before free agency opens, meaning other teams couldn't try and offer Le'Veon Bell more money. Um, the Steelers could franchise tag Bell and then actually sign him to a longer term deal. And when Art Rooney II, you know, he dodged on a question about whether or not the Steelers would franchise tag Bell a couple weeks ago, uh, he said that he wants to be part of the long term future. They could do both. Uh, and, and that's not really an unreasonable thing. It gives them a lot more time to work out a deal through June and I think even July if they slap the tag on him and then get to a long term deal. I think Bell wants to be in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh wants Bell to be there it would make sense for them to, to do both, if that makes sense. That said, we are asking you all on PennLive.com if you think the Steelers should franchise Tag Bell, and you have the option of that sort of third cop-out I just laid out for you. So vote as you wish, see what other people think. We'll appreciate your input. We got a question coming in from Scotty C. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Appreciate it, Scotty. Is Tomlin good enough to beat the Pats? I mean, 10 years and we're two and eight, I believe. Isn't it safe to say that as long as Belichick, Brady are in play, we can't. Um, I mean, he can, um, but it's 
the thing that really strikes me as I've looked at Steelers Patriots games and I look back at the one that they just lost, the Steelers obviously have to play one of their obviously uh, have to play one of their best games, and the Patriots have to be a little bit off. But it's not even so much that as the type of game that has to play out. The Patriots can beat you in so many different ways, offensively and defensively, but especially in terms of how they can control the game um, in possession or how quickly they can score if they're so inclined, uh, as you saw in their historic comeback to win the Super Bowl. The answer is yes, but you need Le'Veon Bell for 60 minutes plus of, of football, um, and the Steelers really have to be dictating play and then playing fairly flawlessly. I didn't think it was entirely fair that Ben Roethlisberger, you know, threw his young receivers under the bus um, after the AFC Championship game. They were definitely inexperienced and definitely made mistakes, but the Steelers were trying to come back against a team that makes it extremely difficult to do anything when the clock is not working for you and makes it difficult to do anything that is. So it it is fair to say that this is a Tomlin conversation. I think Tomlin gets a lot of unfair criticism. I also think Bill Belichick is a better coach than Mike Tomlin. So for the Steelers to beat the Patriots, they need some of the football chaos gods to help them arrange a game in such a way that the Steelers are able to control it. Uh, and Le'Veon Bell does have to have one of those 120, 150 couple score type games. Um, so they can do it, but it's a lot of things have to align for them. Whereas for the Patriots, really just a couple things have to, um, because Brady and Belichick being what they are, are, are relative constants. So, you know, it's not something you fire a coach over, obviously, but the Steelers' best path to a Super Bowl is probably someone beating the Patriots for them. That's unfortunate if you're a Steelers fan, it's a fact of life if you're really anyone else who follows the NFL. So to answer your question, I hope I did. Yes, but it's as hard as you think it is, for sure. Um, now, there was some really weird, I wouldn't say news, but things that happened related to Steelers this week. Uh, there's a, a Walking Dead football card of Sammy Coates. He looks like a zombie. Uh, There's really some great photoshopping. You should definitely check that out. Uh, also, James Harrison, as he often does during the regular season, played around with a Snapchat filter and made himself look like a, well, he made his head look like really distorted and weird and he was singing while he was on the elliptical, because of course he was. And he also did this thing where he had like aviators and a little mustache and then shouted things like he was a police officer pulling someone over. Um, some of this is preserved on penlive.com. Others is, is lost to Snapchat infinity, but you should probably follow James Harrison on Snapchat because he's a 39 year old man putting filters on his face and he is not averse to kitten filters. So that's worth checking out. And Artie Burns, the Steelers rookie, now to be second year cornerback, uh, was voted the fifth most attractive player in the NFL. He lost to Joe Flacco, which strikes me as, eh, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> he was joined uh, on that list, I think. There's 400 players like that fans were asked to click through uh, by, I believe, Kobe Hamilton. It was a backup, backup wide receiver, D'Angelo Williams, uh, and a couple others. So kudos to Artie Burns and a couple Steelers. The Steelers did not make the list of top 10 most attractive teams, though. I do not think Mike Tomlin will lose any sleep over this, uh, but, it, but it was the results of this online survey. Uh, lastly, just a couple more things for you. Antonio Brown. I uh, gave an interview with some people, uh, Bleacher Report talked to him and, and some other people around him, and uh, the Bleacher Report columnist reported that Antonio Brown does have some growing up to do. Uh, they were talking about his Facebook Live post and you know how he needs to be less selfish and less concerned with stats. Um, frankly, his stats will be better if the team has another dependable deep receiving threat opposite him, like Martavis Bryant. Uh, and everything tends to take care of itself. It had the past couple of years. But Antonio Brown said he was sorry, very sorry, really, really sorry for his Facebook Live video for the upteenth time. And, um, you know, I'm not sorry for our Facebook Live video. But we will be back next week talking Le'Veon Bell. 
And Scotty C is back. No, we're not leaving. Look, Dan. What do we got, Scotty? You can look at the Dan Quinn. Yeah, I mean, the Steelers definitely sh could have and arguably should have played the Patriots differently. Um, they're not the they're not unbeatable, but I don't know. I as a reporter, I don't really like to get in, into too much into like the tactical uh, opinions of it. I can give you like a little bit of analysis at most, but it basically breaks down like this: the Steelers were trying to be more aggressive as a secondary, you know, being able to just take guys on without much help, uh, without dropping extra people in the coverage this year and they did that to a certain extent but they were also playing a, a lot of zone as they did so they did they did mix in more press man I thought this year than they did last year or at least it was more evident and aggressive when they than they did um, the thing is that the Steelers have been on a 10 game winning streak or nine games coming into coming into New England doing the defense that they'd been doing and then it's the overarching school of thought is okay they should have been more aggressive because Brady picks apart his own and he has and he did and he will probably continue to do so the other side of that coin is well this is what got them there why would you change it and I kind of fall in the space of well you could have come up more aggressive and then fallen back on what you already knew um, the fact of the matter is they got blitzed offensively on that first series, it was evident that the Patriots were going to really have their way with however they wanted to play the Steelers' defense at that point, and there weren't a ton of adjustments coming out of halftime. Players even said so, and not you know tactically, anyways. They just they needed to tackle better. They didn't do that either, and the Steelers got blown out, and their season's over. So I agree that there is a framework in place. I think the the matter of dispute is how ready the Steelers were to do so, and I think when they pick up guys like Artie Burns, when they pick up Sean Davis, when they have Ross Cockrell play the way he has, he's a lot bigger and more in receiver space now, they are building themselves towards being able to do that. Um, but the fact of the matter is they're not going to have done so in time to derail what is without question, you know, the defining dynasty of, of this last decade or so of football. Something I wrote about after the game was just like, Look, when the Patriots, you know, first beat the Steelers in an AFC Championship game, it was, you know, historically speaking, kind of an upset. Uh, by the time this one wrapped up, it was just what happens. Uh, and so it did, and so it was. In any case, no apologies from me and my Facebook Live video or any of its stupid jokes. One of these days we'll get a table and a little candle in here. We're going to keep this background. I think it adds some charm. It brings out different dimensions in my face. But we'll be back taking any of Steelers questions. And frankly, you can ask us any questions in the comments or messages privately. Anytime you'd like, we'll do our best. And, uh, hey, I appreciate you watching. There's a couple more of you out there this week. And uh, it's nice to see you all, even if I, you know, can't. Anyway, happy Friday.